East Asia is a network of tectonic lines, plate boundaries, that control the location of major geological features, including the volcanic arcs. But there are other lines here too, features that have no tectonic significance. They're related to biology. But actually, do they have tectonic controls too? And the most long-standing and best known, apparently non-geological line is the Wallace line. It's the name given to a boundary proposed by the 19th century naturalist, well known now for coming up with the notion of evolution by natural selection, independently of the much more famous Charles Darwin. Alfred Wallace established the idea of biogeography, demonstrating that different regions, even in quite close proximity, can have significant differences in flora and fauna. This is one of his maps, marking the distribution of distinct faunal assemblages, which might be termed Indo-Malayan and Austro-Asian. Other people recognise different animal groupings, so Southeast Asia is carved by biological boundaries, and the transition zone is known by some as Wallacea. But it's a confusing picture. Perhaps at its simplest, it could be characterised classically like this, with marsupials restricted to the Austro-Asian side and a distinct megafauna on the other. Southeast Asia is a complex array of island archipelagos. Did fauna have different abilities to island hop? One of the most difficult crossings is the Lombok Strait. And the Wallace Line goes straight through here. It separates Lombok Island from Bali. It's only 12 kilometres wide at its narrowest, but its central part has a minimum deep section that's over 250 metres down. Connecting back to the mainland of Eurasia, this is the Bali Strait, the Sunda Strait, and the Malacca Strait. It seems that many fauna can cross these, so it's not about distance, it's about the depth of the sea. And these shallower depths mean that apart from Lombok, the other straits would be dry when sea level is lower, so-called low stand. So how has sea level changed globally? This is for the past 2.5 million years covering the Quaternary and it's a spiky signal. To start with, the fluctuations happen quickly but are not very extreme. But since the mid-Pleistocene, the signal is different, with fewer fluctuations, but much deeper. This represents a change in the orbital controls on global temperature, and therefore sea level, from so-called precession, which is due to rotational wobble, to being chiefly controlled by obliquity of the Earth's rotation axis. Which means that since the mid-Pleistocene, sea levels could fall much further, connecting many island groups, but still not enough to close the Lombok Strait. Which brings us to mobile mammals, hominids. The island of Flores, of course, has its own unique species of hominid, Homo floriensis, sometimes characterised as Homo hobbit because of its very small size. So bones and artefacts are found in sedimentary successions, an old riverbed that later flooded to form a lake. So bone-bearing strata are bracketed and contain ash horizons that can be dated radiometrically using the mineral zircon. And these are the results of a study by O'Sullivan and others in 2001, with lots of dated material. The key numbers are these, saying that Homo floriensis was on the island 850,000 years ago. To get there, their ancestors will have had to navigate the Lombok Strait, as migrations came from the west. But perhaps later rises in sea level made journeys too complex and the Flores populations became isolated from other hominid populations, as did other megafauna. So obligatory driven sea level change has promoted transient migrations between otherwise isolated island groups. Hominids weren't the only seafarers though. The ancestors of dwarf elephants, among other megafaunas, were also able to swim across the Lombok Strait. A pinch of salt though. This is an analysis that assumes the floor of the Lombok Strait has not subsided tectonically in the meantime, 
so its depth below sea level applies to those ancient times. Because tectonics is fundamental in explaining diversity in major faunal groups, like these. So let's step back in time. These are Ian Metcalfe's reconstructions of paleogeography. Australia, way south, beginning to drift away from Antarctica. Here's the tip of Eurasia, the Malay Peninsula and Borneo. This is the northern edge of Australia, modern day New Guinea. So the Australian continent drifts north as the southeast Indian ridge spreads. 45 million years ago, the ocean between Eurasia and Australia beginning to close. So let's flip to another paleogeographic reconstruction, this time by Robert Hall. Here's Borneo for reference. And step back to 60 million years ago and run Hall's movie. Chains of volcanic islands above subduction zones that draw in the Australian continent. Here it comes sweeping the island arcs northwards and together creating what in bygone days would have been called land bridges. Two, today's geography. And all this evolving paleogeography changed global climate, spreading along the southeast India ridge, opening the Indian Ocean. Let's centre on Antarctica and use the paleo reconstruction for 32 and 25 million years ago. Antarctica becomes isolated from the South Pole to its present day situation. And Hill and colleagues modelled ocean circulation, first with Australia back close to Antarctica and then again for today. The modern day open ocean corridor keeps Antarctica cold. So plate tectonics has created the conditions for major glaciation, the ice ages. And we see this in the sea level curve for the tertiary, the past 65 million years. A dramatic change from 32 million years ago as the southeast Indian ridge spreads to open wide the ocean basin. So it really is all about tectonics. Land bridges and connections, controlling the gateways, modulated by the transient climatic effects of orbital cycles. Which gets us back to the Wallace line. It's not a single line, not only because different plants and animals can cross different sized seaways, but also because paleogeography and sea level change through geological time. All of this geography is intimately tied to the tectonic processes that operate in our planet.